Dublin's print culture in 1720. Dublin is renowned for its thriving 18th century book trade and its sumptuous book bindings. In the first two decades of the century, the seeds of this vibrant trade were planted. Printing in Ireland was slow to commence, the first title printed in 1551, and it remained in the shadow of London for about a century and a half. The establishment of the Guild of St. Luke the Evangelist, the Guild of Cutlers, Paper Stainers and Stationers in 1670, shows the low level of importance of printers, booksellers and stationers at the period, as they shared a guild with other occupations. Legal protection for literary, pro for literary property was introduced into England in 1709 with the British Copyright Act. The Act was not considered by the Irish Parliament and was not adopted as law. Irish printers, who were small-scale and undercapitalised at this time, could legally print any works first printed in England, Scotland or Wales without having to pay for copy or to pay royalties. This became a problem when the Irish book trade began to develop and Irish printers began to make inroads into British booksellers' profits by supplying the important Irish market. As the century progressed, Irish printers became more active in reprinting and creating a home market for their publications, and they were classed by their London counterparts as pirates. The reprint trade was enormously profitable, and the Dublin book trade flourished by reprinting bestsellers as soon as they appeared in London. Dublin booksellers also undercut the market, by producing books in smaller format, thus reducing the price for the consumer. This anomaly in the law lasted until 1800 and the Act of Union, which extended the Copyright Act to Ireland. By 1720, the book trade is visibly expanding and laying the foundations for its future prominence. A number of printers are at work in the city. Booksellers and book auctions ensure a steady supply of books. A proliferation of newspaper titles bring foreign news and bookbinding is already gaining a reputation for its elegant design and fine workmanship. The small city centre south of the Liffey was home to Dublin's printers of the early 18th century. Most businesses clustered around the Custom House at Essex Bridge. The book trade was primarily situated along the west-east axis from Christchurch Lane to the gates of Trinity College. Printing houses and bookshops were to be found in this tight city centre, in Skinner Row, and in the streets, alleys and courts off Dame Street throughout the century. Some outliers could be found as far west as Mead Street. By the end of the 18th and into the 19th century, the book trade expanded southwards to a more prominent location in Grafton Street and north across the Liffey to Capel Street and Abbey Street and later again into Sackville Street. Catholic booksellers were concentrated in the High Street, Bridge Street area from the early years of the century. They specialised in the supply and distribution of chapbooks, songbooks, school books and prayer books to the Irish country towns, and to peddlers and hawkers who tramped the countryside, bringing their cheap books and trinkets to remote regions and to fairs and markets. The Quaker booksellers also settled in this area, especially at Mead Street, and they too specialised in school books and chapbooks for the country trade. This was a period before house and shop numbering of colour, colourful shop signs to identify businesses. Many of the shop signs related directly to the business, such as the King's Arms for Andrew Crook, King's Printer, and the King's Arms and Two Bibles for George Grierson and his successors, King's Printers for most of the 18th century and the early 19th century. Bookshops identified themselves by appropriate symbols, often associating themselves with famous writers. The more descriptive signs included the printing press, Stationer's Arms, the Bible, the Golden Bible, the Bible and Dove, the Bible and Crown, the Angel and Bible, etc. A succession of booksellers traded at Shakespeare's Head, Sir Isaac Newton's Head, Milton's Head, and later in the 18th century, Homer's Head, Virgil's Head, Swift's Head, Pope's Head, and Addison's Head. The Hoey family traded for a century at the sign of Mercury. Catholic booksellers in High Street traded at the Bible, the Angel and Bible, the King's Head, the Holy Lamb and the Three Candlesticks. Isaac Jackson and his son Robert, Quaker printers, traded at the Globe in Mead Street. Isaac took over the shop of fellow Quaker Samuel Fuller, then named the Globe and Scales. The business of Parliament, the governance of the city, the organisation of trade and commerce and the life of the university depended on the availability of books, pamphlets, government publications, official notices and newspapers. 
The English Short Title Catalogue, ESTC, lists 116 books printed in Dublin in 1720. This is a minimum figure, as it refers to surviving copies, mainly in public institutions around the world, so it's not a definitive calculation. The subject matter was varied. A broad subject classification shows religious titles topping the list, with satirical works also prominent. Political works and those dealing with Ireland's trade and commerce and the law were also to the fore, while plays and poetry were well represented. In smaller numbers, almanacs, literature, history and travel, gardening, criminal speeches, a book sale catalogue and a proclamation were present. One pamphlet printed by Elizabeth Sadler on a topical subject, The Plague at Marseille Considered, by Richard Bradley, dealt with the epidemic which broke out in Marseille in May 1720, and which included advice on how to halt the spread of the infection. ESTC lists just two newspapers, but in fact a number of newspapers were in circulation, as, as we shall see later. 31 printers and booksellers can be identified from the ESTC imprints. Newspaper advertising identifies additional booksellers active in the city, and in Belfast, Cork, Limerick, Waterford, Clonmel and other towns in Ireland. At this period, the term bookseller encompassed the modern role of publisher. For large and expensive books, or those with a limited projected readership, such as books of poetry, publishing by subscription was a viable option for printers. Part of the cost could be gathered before publication to help with production costs. Prepayment also served to define the expected audience for a work. Names, sometimes with occupation and address, were printed as part of the work. For the subscriber, the cost of the volume was spread over time, and they had the pleasure of having their names associated with the work. For the researcher, the presence of subscription lists gives a window into the interest group for an author or work. Books with subscription lists have a better chance of survival, as they were collected and preserved by historians. Clarendon's History of the Civil War in England, in three volumes folio with plates, was a high value and costly work. Accordingly, proposals to print it by subscription were issued by booksellers John Hyde and Robert Owen. It was a long lead in for such a work. Advertised in January 1719, it was published one year later in early 1720. The cost to subscribers was 24 shillings in sheets, that's one pound four shillings half to be paid when subscribing, and the remainder on delivery. The advertisement warned that non-subscribers would pay not less than 30 shillings in sheets. That's £1.10 shillings. When the completed work was advertised in February 1720, the cost was £1.16 shillings for the three volumes, although it's not clear if it was bound or in sheets. At the same time, Clarendon's History of the Rebellion and Civil Wars in Ireland was published in one volume octavo by bookseller Patrick Dubin. The printer claimed that this edition is much more correct than that of London, having been compared with the two manuscripts. In 1720, two substantial religious works from different traditions were printed by subscription. Cornelius Neri, Catholic Archbishop, Catholic Parish Priest for St. Michael's, New History of the World, printed by Edward Waters for Luke Dowling, and Robert Saup, late prebend of Westminster's sermons in two volumes folio, printed for Patrick Dugan and Joseph Leithley. Neri's history cost one guinea neatly bound, half to be paid in advance, and it was completed in September 1720. Humphrey Predo, Dean of Norwich's Old and New Testament, was published by subscription in two parts. The first appeared in 1719 and the second in 1720. Matthew Concanon's poem The Football Match, a slim octavo volume, published by subscription in 1720, was printed for the author. Two volumes of plays by Charles Shadwell, Shadwell, each volume containing four titles, were also printed by subscription for George Risk, Joseph Leakley and Patrick Dugan. One of the best sellers of the period, Daniel Defoe's The Life and Strange Surprising Adventures of Robinson Crusoe of York, Mariner, had no need of subscription publication when it was issued by a group of Dublin booksellers in 1719, with the farther adventures of Robinson Crusoe following later in the same year. Life could be precarious for printers at this period, and not just financially. Printing pamphlets which cr criticised government could lead to prosecution and jail. Printers remain, remained anonymous if the subject matter seemed inflammatory. Jonathan Swift's printers 
often issued his more politically contentious pamphlets at their peril. Swift is most associated with the Dublin printer and bookseller George Faulkner, but their working relationship did not begin until 1728. For his earlier works, Swift was associated with Edward Waters, John and Sarah Harding, and John Hyde. Waters had his print works at the new post office printing office in Essex Street, at the corner of Sycamore Alley. Married to Sarah Gunn, daughter of Matthew Gunn, bookseller and bookbinder, he collaborated with his father-in-law on various projects. He had fallen foul of the civil authorities in 1714 and again in 1715 for printing seditious libels. In 1720, he printed Swift's proposal for the universal use of Irish manufacture, for which he was brought to trial by grand jury for printing an insolent and seditious pamphlet. Eventually, the prosecution was dropped thanks to Swift's intervention. John Harding was printer of the Dublin and Partial Newsletter and Flying Post or Postboy newspapers, with his first address from 1718 to 1720, given as the new post office printing office, that, that's Edward Waters' address. In April 1720, he moved to the middle of Dirty Lane. By June 1721, the printing office was at Molesworth Court, Fishamble Street. In 1720, he printed a prologue for the Theatre Royal by Thomas Sheridan, with an epilogue by Swift. The following year, he was engaged by Swift to print protests against the proposed Bank of Ireland, and in December 1721, he was ordered into custody for a libel on the House of Commons. He spent time in hiding and in prison from 1722 to early 1724 when he was released. His wife Sarah ran the business in his absence, and she printed Swift's present miserable state of Ireland in 1721. John printed Swift's first five Drapier's letters after his release. Published anonymously, a proclamation offered £300 for identification of the author. John Harding was prosecuted as the printer and once again taken into custody. He died in April 1725. Sarah took over the business and continued to publish Swift's pamphlets. She is best known as printer of a modest proposal in 1729. John Hyde's business was on a much firmer footing than the Hardings, with his premises on Dame Street. He was active in the Guild, with the position on the Council from 1708, elected Warden in 1710 and Master in 1718. He printed Swift's Conduct of the Allies in 1711. In 1715, he was indicted for his involvement with the publication of Advice to the Freeholders, printed by Edward Waters. In 1726, he published the first Dublin edition of Travellers in Travels into several remote nations by Lemuel Gulliver, where under swift supervision he corrected several errors in the London edition. The number of books printed in Dublin and the variety of their subject matter at this period was limited. However, importation of stock from London and the continent and auctions of second-hand books and libraries of collectors expanded the range of titles available. Book auctions and sale by catalogue took place in Dublin from at least the 1690s. The book auctions brought to Dublin by London bookseller John Dunton are vividly described in his Dublin Scuffle, published in 1699. Dunton's pen pictures of Dublin's booksellers of the period give an extraordinary window into the book trade in the city and the personalities of, it, of its members. British booksellers sold their books in Ireland from the early days of printing. By the 18th century, Ireland was their second largest export market for books after North America. Importation from the continent was evident from the late 17th century, but this traffic was small and often geared towards individual readers. From 1725, cousins John Smith and William Bruce set up contacts with the Netherlands, and William Smith moved from Dublin to become their agent in Amsterdam. They began to import a wide range of books in Latin and French. In 1726, they issued a catalogue of books newly arrived from England, Holland and France. John Smith continued to import continental editions until 1758 when he retired from business. Towards the end of 1718, the Catholic bookseller James Malone retired from business at the Holy Lamb on High Street, and his choice collection of books, Divinity, Law, History and Physic, was put up for auction in January 1719. Luke Dowling, Catholic bookseller next door to the Woolpack in High Street, and formerly Malone's apprentice, bought up what remained unsold of Malone's choice collection, which he offered for sale by auction in August 1719. 
Dowling took over Malone's stock of chat books, prayer books and school books, which he offered for sale wholesale and retail. It's evident that Malone's book stock was made up of separate sections, the choice collection of more expensive works aimed at scholarly readers and his stock destined for Chapman and the country market. The Quaker bookseller Samuel Fuller, with his shop The Globe and Sales in Mead Street, was in business from 1719. He specialised in mathematical books and instruments, as well as school books and chat books for the country trade. He imported stock from London and in 1720 issued a list of books available from his shop appended to Crisp's short history of a long travel. Newspapers, both printed and in manuscript, which were important for bringing news from abroad, were imported from London, Paris and the Netherlands from the 17th century. News of wars, parliamentary proceedings and of commercial concerns were important for legislators and merchants to keep up to date with developments in the world. From 1685, the first regular newspaper, The Newsletter, was published in Dublin and new newspaper titles proliferated in the early decades of the 18th century. The early papers were largely devoted to foreign news and only carried a scatter of advertisements for local businesses before 1720. The production of newspapers formed an important element of the book trade. Costing a half penny to a penny, they were sold by annual or quarterly subscription to readers in Dublin and the country. News hawkers also sold them on, on Dublin streets. In the early years, they were brought out twice a week to coincide with the post to the country. If important news came in between issues, a supplementary sheet or express was washed out, often printed on one side only. By 1720, newspaper printers John Harding, Cornelius Carter, Richard Pugh, Thomas Hume and John Whaley issued a variety of newspaper titles. Titles such as Dublin Post, Dublin Postman, Flying Post or Postbag, Postboy and variations on these titles were common among the early printers. Harding's Dublin Impartial Newsletter, Dublin Mercury, Impartial Occurrences, later called Pew's Occurrences, Dublin Gazette, Dublin Courant, Dublin Evening Post, Weekly Packet and Whaley's Newsletter all vied for market share at this period. At the end of the 17th century and the first decades of the 18th century, the streets and alleys near the Custom House, centering on Essex Street and Essex Gate, Skinner Row and Cork Hill, formed the commercial hub of the city. Many of Dublin's busiest coffee houses were to be found in close proximity to the Custom House. Dempsters, the Merchants and the Custom House in Essex Street, Lucas's on Cork Hill, Dick's and Pedro's in Skinner Row, the Post Office in Fishamble Street and Pat's on High Street. John Gilbert, in his three-volume history of the City of Dublin, was the first to name very many of the city's coffee houses and their proprietors. Booksellers and newspaper printers were closely associated with Dublin's coffee houses in the early 18th century. Coffee houses acted as centres for news and information, providing newspapers and pamphlets for their customers. They were gathering places for merchants and professionals who exchanged business and political information. Catalogues for book sales could be viewed at coffee houses and purchasers could sign up for subscription editions of books. Printing houses often shared the premises with the coffee house in the first half of the 18th century. One of the most famous, Dick's Coffee House, occupied the drawing room or first floor of the house in Skinner Row known as Carberry House. This was the former home of Gerald, the ninth Earl of Kildare. Dick's was established by Richard Pugh, bookseller and newspaper proprietor in the late 17th century. John Dunton, the London bookseller, held book auctions at the back of Dick's in 1698. Dunton said of Richard Pugh, Dick is a witty and ingenious man, makes the best coffee in Dublin and is very civil and obliging to all his customers. Dick's closed its doors about 1780 when Carberry House was demolished. And in conclusion, by the beginning of the 18th century, the book trade in Dublin was beginning to find its feet after a century and a half in the shadow of the London trade. Dublin printers began to publish reprints of works already published in Great Britain and some homegrown titles by Irish authors. The trade catered to the tastes of scholarly readers by importing expensive works from London and the continent, and with book auctions and sale by catalogue adding to the variety of reading matter available. When John Donton came to Dublin with his book auctions in 1698, he found booksellers already selling books in this way. Writers such as Thomas Sheridan and Jonathan Swift went to local printers to print their pamphlets. 
Newspaper titles were beginning to multiply, but many were short-lived. In the next few years, a number of stable, long-lasting enterprises, such as Faulkner's Job Dublin Journal from 1725, were published. The vibrant coffeehouse culture in the city supported the book trade by operating in close proximity to print workshops. Working closely with book trade personnel, supplying and consuming news and information, and by creating reading space for merchants and professional men. Thank you.